My name is Patrice Dabrowski. Uh, I'm a historian of Central and Eastern Europe and affiliated with Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, the Center for European Studies, and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. I'm the author of three books, and today I will be talking to you about the third of my books, which is titled The Carpathians Discovering the Highlands of Poland and Ukraine. There's a lot of things that attracted me to the subject of the Carpathians. I will admit to having made the acquaintance of the Carpathians first when I was on a junior year abroad uh, in Poland. And uh, I learned to love the mountains, learned to climb them. And so that's one dimension of my interest. I also have to admit that I met my husband in the mountains, which is another reason for me to have a great sentiment to them. But academically, I didn't come to a mountain topic until a bit later. And I tend to credit Professor Simon Schama for planting the seed of interest in the Carpathians as a historical topic. Many years ago, when I was an utterly green graduate student, and he knew of my interest in this part of the world, uh, he had just finished writing a book called Landscape and Memory. And so he asked me, uh, what kind of landscape do Poles love the most? Now, he assumed it would be forests, such as the Białowieża forests on the border with, uh, with Belarus beautiful primeval forest, but I thought for a minute and I said, well, I think it's actually the mountains, the Tatra mountains, which are part of the Carpathian mountain system. So uh, at that point, I didn't know how right I was, but uh, at any rate, uh, that's uh, one way that I started thinking about the mountains as a topic. I didn't return to it though until after writing my dissertation, which was on a completely different subject. But I came to them back through a, a slightly different uh, angle. That is, I was thinking then not only about the beautiful mountains, but about the people who live in the mountains, the indigenous highlanders. Because one of the things that I wanted to investigate further is something that I did a little bit with in my first book, was how peasants, became national beings. That is, most peasants, certainly in the 19th century, thought of themselves in local terms. Either they were from a local uh, uh, region, or they were thought of themselves as Christians, or maybe even the emperor's people, but they didn't think of themselves as, say, Poles or Ukrainians. Uh, so I thought it'd be interesting to investigate a discrete group of Highlanders uh, and I started off with the Highlanders I knew the best, the Tatra Mountain Highlanders. Now, much to my surprise, when I started investigating them and their contact with uh, nationally conscious lowlanders, um, I was reading the um, yearbook of the Tatra Society. Now, the Tatra Society is the first Polish Alpine club. And this is, they were founded in 1873. So a few years after that, they started write, uh, publishing a yearbook. And in the very first issue of that yearbook, I read about not only um, the Tatra Mountain Highlanders and the beautiful mountains, but also I came across an article about Hutzels. Now, Hutzels are the Highlanders of the Eastern Carpathians. Uh, I knew nothing about them at the time, but I said, gee, this is another group that is clearly being discovered in a way at this moment. So I decided to investigate them as well. So all of this uh, sort of um, escalated into the further development of my project. And only later on would I uh, add a, a third mountain region to my study, which is the Bishchada mountains, uh, which are at present the southeastern corner of, the, of Poland today. So I have essentially the Tatra mountains uh, of the western Carpathians, uh, the Hutzel region of the eastern Carpathians, today part, very much part of Ukraine, and the Bieszczady mountains of what, what one might call the central Carpathians, as given the way these are all located on the map. 
so that's essentially uh, how I came to the project. Uh, another reason for writing is simply that so little is known about the Carpathians. When you look for books on of history on the Carpathians, you're not going to find very much. So this is my chance to write something that might help to open up the Carpathians and enlighten people that is English speakers as to their beauty, as to their significance, and so on. My book is a study of how these three discrete mountain ranges of the vast Carpathian mountain system were discovered for um, a regional public in the 19th and 20th centuries. Now, these people who are the discoverers are in themselves a little bit paradoxical because I'm looking at peoples, Poles and Ukrainians, who are not identified with mountains at all. I mean, when you think about poles, you think about uh, uh, the country of the plains, fields, even when the, the name Poland comes from field, uh, Ukrainians are identified with the steppe. So for me, one of the interesting things was how did they manage to become so enamored of the mountains and put great stock in what they found and to take advantage of this a uh, rarefied position up in the mountains to rethink problems of the lowlands. So I, I certainly spent some time in the mountains in all three areas, uh, but one cannot write a book of history simply based on one's walking through, you know, hiking through the regions and meeting people there, although of course all of those contacts proved to be very useful. Uh, I did a lot of my research in the archives, libraries, and museums of Poland, Ukraine, Austria, and some work in the United States. Although I also had a very interesting uh, source who was, uh, or is indeed, uh, in uh, Australia. This is uh, in the, the, for the last part of my book, because my book is divided into three parts, the Tatra Mountains part, the uh, Eastern Carpathians part and the Bishtade part. Well, in the Bishtade part, since the, the discovery took place after World War II, this historian finally got to meet, at least via the internet, someone who was actually participating in the discovering at the time. So I have this contact uh, in Australia because he ended up emigrating from Poland to Australia. Uh, who was sending me scans of his beautiful archive. And so this is another way that I was able to do research, but primarily it was through the, the normal si uh, kinds of archives. I mean, the archive in Ivano Frankis, for example, was very, very important for me to understand what was happening in the Hutzel region in the interwar period, that is, in the 1930s. Um, Another interesting place where I was able to find material in Poland was in the Central Military Archive. Now, you wouldn't assume that a topic dealing with the mountains would have a military dimension, but indeed it does. So there's all these different things that by tracing what I was able to find in Archive X or Y or Z, it led me yet to another place and another destination, and, and I was able to gather enough material to be able to write this book. Of course, there is some scholarship in those languages. I'm, I'm more concerned, you know, when I was talking earlier about the fact that in English you really find gener uh, relatively little, and it's always that the Carpathians are this terra incognita. No one quite knows where they are. They're sort of mysterious and dark and whatever. But one of the things that these alpine clubs that were springing up during the period of my research were doing was research. In the mountains because one of their, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, one of their mandates was to do research and to popularize and the like. So these are pretty much the beginnings of research being done, scholarship being done. I mean, not entirely the beginnings, but it's early on in the game because these regions just were not very high on, uh, not very distinct on the radar of these two nations prior to these uh, periods. There's very little that you would be able to find on an earlier period. I mean, one of the earliest sources of information on the mountains is uh, actually, it is actually from the late uh, 18th century when the, um, the Habsburg authorities gained control over what became the Habsburg province of Galicia. And so they sent a 
uh, a scientist into the mountains to do research because they were interested in seeing if there were sources of, of, of uh, economic uh, uh, enrichment for them there. They were mines, salt mines, gold mines, uh, you know, whatever else they could find. So this um, scholar actually traveled through the Carpathian Mountains and, and noted the people there, noted what was available there and reported back to uh, the Habsburg authorities. But that's really early in the game. Uh, the, the tourists start coming in really much in the 19th century and those are at first very sporadic not until you get into the second half of the 19th century, which is when I pick up my story, do you really have the beginnings of a, of a real thrust into the mountains, a real surge into the mountains on the part of vacationers and, and mountain climbers. The part I think that you're after is talking about how um, uh, the Tatra Mountains became this uh, uh, Poland of the mind, so to speak, in a period when there was no Polish state. Because this is a very important thing that we have when we're looking at the, the, this, this peripheral region um, in the 19th century. Neither Poles nor Ukrainians have any state of their own, right? So their main preoccupation tends to be with things national. How do we create a modern, Polish or Ukrainian nation, and they take advantage of being in the mountains to do that, essentially. I mean, you have Zakopane, this um, mountain resort that now springs up out of this little village that was really nothing mid-century. A whole resort is created in the mountains, and you have uh, Poles from all over coming there and vacationing there. It's, it's sort of, uh, it, it becomes very fashionable. I, I know who you're referring to because it's Anthony Amato, who I uh, wrote a, a very wonderful book about the Carpathians. It just came out this last year. And uh, of course, he comes at it extremely from the position of environmental history. I mean, I read his dissertation when it first came out. Uh, many years ago, and now he's turned it into this wonderful book, so I was very happy to see that. Well, of course, the, the whole thing is with the discovery of these regions comes the development of the regions. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the discovering is that it tends to appear at times when at least the discoverers feel that the local population is in crisis. Uh, for Let me just give you the example from the Tatra Mountain region. I mean, one of the sources of, uh, I mean, these, these are hard scrabble lands, these mountain regions, not very good for agriculture. At best, they're good for uh, herding sheep and, and things like that. But um, some of the uh, Highlanders had been employed uh, in the lumber industry for a certain period, and then that sort of went uh, uh, bust a bit, and they lost their, their sources of employment. In fact, that led Highlanders, I mean, hi Highlanders migrated to the Americas and things like that, sometimes because of that reason, because of the economics were so difficult. But when you have the discovery taking place, then you have a potential for developing a tourist industry, don't you? And that's something that is very much developed in the course of my three uh, different discoveries. Obviously, they take place at different times. I mean, the Tatra Mountains are uh, developed in the late 19th, early 20th century. The Hutzel region gets its first taste of development in the late 19th, but particularly in the interwar period of the 20th century. And the Bishtade Mountains get theirs only after World War II. Now, the development, of course, is a two-edged sword because um, tourism, as Hal Rothman has written his wonderful book, is, is, is essentially a, a devil's bargain. Uh, you know, you, you have everything coming into the region, people coming into the region, building and the like, but you also have the degradation of the region. Uh, although uh, clearly 
for tourism, you have to be very careful not to push it too far uh, because then you are ruining the whole reason for being there in the mountains in the first place. So it's you're treading a fine line that way, but I think it's fascinating to, to trace how this de development does take place and what happens and how you've got Highlanders now building uh, villas for the tourists and turning into mountain guides instead of being brigands and um, otherwise making money off of the tourists. And so their lifestyle uh, takes a big jump forward, if, if I may say so. But at the same time, you have to be concerned about what happens to the land. Too, too many roads and things can be a problem at different times. I mean, in the early years, no one was really thinking about, about expending the, the nature of the region. But as I get into the later chapters, especially dealing with the Bishtade Mountains, when you've got um, the communist authorities trying to turn the region into an economically viable one. And they build roads and they cut down so many trees and they uh, uh, quarry rock right in the prettiest parts of the mountains. Yes, all of this is, is very dangerous. And so you've always got this tension here going on uh, between uh, conservation, which you need for tourism as well, and development. What I'm dealing with in the mountains are the northern slopes of the mountains. These are the colder, gloomier, more remote uh, from, um, uh, from any you know, sort of lowland destination mountains that one has there. The Slovaks and the Romanians and others have a much easier access into the mountain. They, they get the sunny side of them. Development takes on a different, um, shape, let's say, in those parts. I was much more interested in finding out how these discoverers, uh, and I'll talk about them a little bit more in a moment, how these discoverers came in uh, having to expend a lot of energy and effort uh, in the northern, uh, on the northern slopes of the Carpathians. I, it it, it, it uh, was a lot less obvious that this was going to happen. And it was a lot less obvious also because the people who were the discoverers because I, you know, I've told you about Poles and Ukrainians, but what Poles and what Ukrainians are the ones who make the big difference is also an interesting question. And here I would say is if you look at the province of, of, of Galicia, it's not the Galicians so much who are doing the discovering, but people who come from further away from the Russian empire all right, in the 19th century. It's people who come, the Poles coming from Warsaw. It's a Wars, Warsaw physician who is credited with discovering the Tatra Mountains. In the Eastern uh, Carpathians, uh, I think very instrumental were people like Mihailo Kotzubinsky, who also came from the Russian Empire, and Nat Hotkevich from Kharkiv. Now, Kharkiv is a good distance away from the mountains. These people come in with a completely different perspective than do the Galicians. Certainly in the early period, what you have is, uh, is a movement of individuals, members of what we would call the intelligentsia. So these are the, this is the educated stratum of society that we're talking about. It's these people who come to the mountains and become fascinated with them and then start spreading the word about them. Uh, only in the interwar period can I say that there's a governmental dimension in there, a very fascinating one. Uh, but in the earliest periods, definitely there's no government pushing this. Although the, that you actually get someone as important as Emperor Franz Josef coming into the, uh, uh, Eastern Carpathians at a certain moment in time. That is, he comes to Kolomea for an ethnographic exhibition and is thus exposed to the Hutzels and their beautiful culture and everything. But it was not he who was commissioning things. It were the people, they, they were the people on the ground, the members of the Tatra society who were behind all of this. That is, so you have the, the early people uh, creating the, this, these alpine clubs 
And uh, much as were, were Alpine clubs were being created elsewhere in Europe at the time. So it's not an entirely foreign phenomenon. I mean, right in, in, in 1873, at the same time you have the, the, the Poles creating the Tatra Society, right across the border you've got the Hungarians and Germans there creating their own uh, Hungarian uh, Tatra Society, if you will, or I've forgotten what the name of it was. And, and uh, only a couple of years earlier, you'd have Germans and Austrians and um, so on uh, creating their own Alpine clubs. So this is a, an interesting phenomenon across the, across the board, but I think Poles and Ukrainians use it in very interesting ways. The railway was extremely important uh, for the development of the regions and for the penetration of the mountains by tourists, yes. Um, prior to that point, what you had were essentially dirt roads of the poorest kind, if you had roads. In many cases, what you had were uh, people riding in carts along the riverbeds or close to the riverbeds. It, 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 to get up into the mountains. It took you several days to do that, to get there. So it was quite difficult and it was a little painful too because of the, the rockiness of the terrain. I mean, think of these um, uh, covered wagons, if you will, without any real springs to them and you will, you will get a sense of what it was like making the trip. So one of the first things that some of these developers want to do is to bring the railway in. And they do that, at least in the Tatra Mountains, in two uh, stages. First, they get it halfway into the, into the mountain region, and then they lobby for it to come all the way up to Zakopane. And already the, with the first trip, it, it completely it, it made it unnecessary for you to have to spend the night in a bug-infested uh, um, inn along the way. And by the time you get the train coming all the way, it's just, it's an easy trip now. You can come up, you, you don't have to come up for the entire summer anymore because you wouldn't go back and forth because it was so painful. But you can come up for a shorter stay, hike in the mountains, climb them, and, and then go home. So it helps even to transform the type of tourism that is possible. I was surprised to see, well, first of all, I was surprised to see how important these outsiders, the, 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 the lowlanders from the, the Russian Empire were in facilitating uh, the discovery. That was one surprise for me because I would have expected that it, it would have been a, a local development sort of thing. So having these Varsovians or people from Kharkiv or elsewhere coming in was, was already to one uh, thing interesting. But um, I am also, was also taken aback at how significant the mountains came to be uh, for these respective nations. Now, this is true, I think, to a greater extent uh, with the Poles than the Ukrainians, although I think Ukrainians uh, uh, were pushing in that direction, is this that they didn't have as much opportunity given the later political developments to do so. Um, but the significance of the mountains transcended uh, the remote and peripheral position of the mountains vis-a-vis -vis these two nations. What you had uh, taking place was the 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 shaping of the mountains into a sort of realm of experimentation where, que where answers to the burning questions of the day could be worked out. I mean, you had this rarefied air of the mountains, uh, this new perspective on life. All of this became important. And so this is, uh, these, this is one of the, the, the main um, findings that I think I have is that the mountains were far from peripheral when you look at it that way. And that, you know, you usually think of them uh, as being more peripheral just because of their location. But at these moments of discovery, they became much more centrally important. Yeah, well, this is, of course, a wonderful question, because remember, for the most part, we're dealing with illiterate peasants. And so for me to find, to track down what they actually thought was always, um, like looking for a needle in the haystack. Uh, you know, I do know certain things because there were certain literate um, 
uh, Gurales, certain literal, literate Hutzels who were able to write about uh, what happened. But I think, first of all, they were a bit bemused that people should want to come into the mountains and want to hike in them for pur purposes of pleasure. I mean, for them, this was work. You know, they took their sheep up into the mountains, into the, 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 the meadows to pasture them. This was not something, they didn't hike, climb mountains to scale peaks and say, I was the first one to be here and all that. That, it was completely foreign to them. So they were a bit bemused by all of it. On the other hand, they were also thankful that they had people coming in and wanting to help them because it was not just that the Highlanders were coming in and thank you, you're here and we're going to do our own thing. They also were very interested in these populations and they wanted them to thrive. And so, you know, they, they, they helped them out. You know, in the Tatra Mountain region, you had a woodworking school founded for the Highlanders or a lace making school founded for the Highland women and things like that. They were, think, they were providing them with clover for, for, their, for their meadows and fields uh, so that the, the, the land would be more fruitful uh, and things like that. So you have Highlanders actually, well, certainly in the Tatra Mountain region, waiting every year for these tourists to come and being very thankful for the amount of income that they were able to receive. So it, was, it made a huge difference in their lives. Again, when you're talking about the, the, the Eastern Carpathians, I mean, it's a big region the mountains are and people in certain pockets of the mountains were the ones most to profit uh for example let's let's take the the construction of the stanislav volenka railway that is going from ivano frankis to the hungarian border and beyond though those villages along that region were the ones to profit not hutzels who were back up in the in the high mountains elsewhere so i mean it, it's it's not it's a spotty um phenomenon it's not an all-encompassing phenomenon by any stretch of the imagination so there are always pockets of poverty um not too far away from pockets of, of greater affluence so i mean that would be part of part of all of this uh, if you look at the Tatra society, again, uh, when I was reading those yearbooks that I talked about earlier and talking about the article written about the Hutzels, that article was written by a Ruthenian priest from the village of Zabio, today's Verhovina. And he was very keen to cooperate with the Tatra society activists. I mean, he wrote more articles. He's the one who helped found a branch of the Tatra society out in the Eastern Carpathians and the like. So there was interaction there, you know, and I'm sure that they, they all, the, the, the intelligentsias knew the languages back and forth. I mean, if you had a Ukrainian intelligentsia, they could read the Polish uh, scientific reports. I'm sure they did. Um, so, you know, it's and uh, maybe less so in the other direction, to be sure. Uh, but um, since Poles were dominant in the Tatra society, certainly the articles that were being published by Ukrainians in it were being published in, 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 in Polish. And, and they were helping to spread information that Poles did not have access to uh, to them. The battle for the soul of the Bishchade. Well, the Bishchade mountains are quite specific in this book. This is a region that after World War II uh, looked completely different than, than after World War I. That is, in the interwar period, the Bishchade region was very heavily populated believe it or not, by Boykos and, and by Lemkos for the, for the most part, although a lot of Jews in the region as well, some Poles, Germans, um, Gypsies, that is Roma and the like. But World War II put an end to a lot of that. That is, World War II obviously took care of eliminating the region's Jews. And in the wake of the war, you had uh, Operation Vistula on the part of the Poles, which removed the remaining uh, East Slavs, be they Boykos or Lemkos, from the region. 
So you have this region emptying out. And of course, the, the UPA and everything was busy fighting in the region, burning down villages and other sorts of things so that Poles couldn't move in. Um, so you had great destruction in the region, but and the region became a no man's land for a good decade or so. And everything, you know, these you had these burned down villages that became overgrown with all kinds of plants. Uh, and things like that. It became a, a wilderness, a, a, a secondary wilderness, and it became very attractive to Polish climbers once they, uh, once the the beginnings of of tourism returned to the mountains. Because again, for a, a long time, it was uh, territory off limits, really, because of the fighting that was taking place. So, on the one hand, you have um, uh, tourists. And by tourists, I don't mean tourists the way we think of it in, in, in English. Tourists means tourists of the hiking kind, the, the ones who you expend energy through their feet conquering territory. That's the sort of tourist uh, uh, that I'm referring to here, the, the qualified tourists, as it, the term later comes to be, to be um, uh, uh, shaped. But you have them, on the one hand, wanting uh, to keep this territory wild because it's now the only place in the Polish state where one can really trek across the region and hike to one's uh, uh, fill and enjoy the bountiful nature and, and be away from the center of the country, which is becoming more and more industrialized. So you have this uh, uh, facet uh, going on, this part of the discovery. But on the other hand, the, this battle for the soul of the Bishtade is being fought by these same tourists because they are up against the state. They're up against the central authorities who think that the Bishtade mountains should be treated just like any other part of this uh, uh, burgeoning socialist turned communist state, right? Uh, it should become a productive cog in the socialist wheel, so to speak. That is, uh, they, they want to repeat, repopulate the region. They want to develop the region. And again, they, they build multiple huge highways in the region, roads all over the place so as to uh, get to the lumber, the rich lumber that is there. Uh, they quarry rock. Uh, they, uh, they build... Um, uh, reservoirs, that is hydroelectric power comes in, and, but reservoirs which also turn out to be a, a huge attraction for the tourists. So uh, they can't win. I mean, people still want to, to, to vacation in this region. And as far as the, the battle for the soul of the Bishade goes, you have a group of students at a certain point students at the Warsaw Polytechnic who are out saying, we are rediscovering the Bishtade. That is, we want the Bishtade to, uh, to remain in their seemingly pristine natural state. And they propose uh, what they call a tourist preserve. Uh, that the whole southern region along the border be reserved only for the sort of tourists that they are. Now, the government is not crazy about this idea at all. And, and, uh, and so the battle is essentially between the government still doing everything that it can to develop the region, and on the other hand, um, society. Uh, at least a, 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 a certain part of society, very intent on not letting that happen. But of course, given the, the, the weight of everything, uh, the government tends to have the say. And only towards the very end of my story, when we talk about the solidarity period in Poland, does it look like things are going to change? But I'll leave that there. I'll leave that for the reader to discover him or herself. I guess you could say that the government had a different attitude towards the Highlanders. Now, it's, it, again, recall that if we're looking at the Bieszczady Mountains, the Highlanders are removed, right? They, they are sent into the, the newly gained Western territories of Poland, that is those who were not earlier uh, exchange in the population transfer that was taking place already at, towards the end of World War II. So you have these populations completely removed. They obviously, they, 
they don't like these populations. They, they don't want them in the mountains and some return to the mountains, but they don't want them there. They really want everything to be Polish in a real Polish nationalistic sort of way. So they have a completely different approach. They even have a different approach to the, the Tatra mountain Gurale who are for all practical purposes considered Polish. And that is in part because they don't trust them. They were too business oriented already in the interwar period. They're too independent. They're, 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 they're not the, the sort of uh, peasants or farmers that, that one can more easily control. And so they don't care much for them either. And they, they want to, uh, and, and well, among other things, they, they don't want them to over uh, graze the, the Tatra mountain. So they start trying to send the Tatra mountain Gurale to graze their uh, sheep in the Dishtade mountains. So there's, they, they treat them in a very different way than we saw the Highlanders being treated both in the late 19th and the early 20th century. I don't know how much I said actually about the Carpathian Mountains per se. Maybe I should say just a couple of words about them. I'm assuming your audience does know something about the Carpathians at this point. I mean, what I would say is that the Carpathian Mountains are indeed the continuation of the Alps of Western and Central Europe. They're this wonderful continuation that is are so little known in the West, however, because of the vagaries of history. Uh, again, I think I already did mention things such as uh, the 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 actual prominence the, uh, of, of, of the physical feature of the Carpathians, which again, no pun intended, uh, is important for the region. Again, it, it, because it is a natural region, in a region that has been industrialized over the years, it is one of the few places in at least this part of Europe where you have that biodiversity, where you've got um, all these wonderful plants and animals for, for another uh, part. I mean, you've got bears and, and uh, bison and other sorts of animals in, in the, you know, beyond the normal foxes and, and uh, animals of that type uh, in the area. And all of this is, it's important to maintain these areas as they are, I think because of this, because we don't want to lose that biodiversity, lose the, the flora and fauna that are otherwise so difficult to, to replicate if ever, if it could ever be replicated. I mean, once it's gone, it's gone. And I don't think anyone who knows the Carpathian Mountains wants that to happen. Well, what I'd like to do is continue working a bit on the Carpathians. I mean, I have, my book focuses on shall we say, a relatively narrow topic that is the actual discovery of the mountains by these lowlanders. But there's much more that can be done with the topic overall. It's not just, I mean, I, I look at three discrete moments in time that is, you know, the little micro histories, but, you know, work such as Anthony Amato has done that takes a longer look at things or even going into the more recent period uh, I, I can I can tell you that I, I had actually written a uh, an epilogue to the book that I ended up not using, which takes things up much more recently, and perhaps I will do something with that. Uh, so a little bit less deep historical uh, work, but perhaps also interesting. Oh, there's one last thing that I wanted to to say. The, the uh, significance of the book, I think, is also that. Uh, it's these discoveries of these regions of the mountains that have helped to shape the way both Poles and Ukrainians view the mountains and the highlanders of the mountains. I mean, even if you look at things uh, today, Poles since the late 19th century have become a, a mountain climbing nation. I mean, they were among the first to uh, reach the peaks of the Himalayas. Uh, a, a, a Paul Jerzy Kukurska was able to to do the what do they call it? the Himalayan crown to to summit all those fourteen huge huge peaks that that uh, uh, Reinhold Meissner first was able to do. So you have poles pushing to the mountains. You can't explain it unless you 
know about the discovery of the mountains. In the Ukrainian case, you also have this fascinating aspect of Ukrainian culture seizing upon the Hutzels and their culture. Uh, think only about Ruslana uh, from the music side of things. I mean, uh, her wild dances. Uh, and so all of this is still very current in 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 uh, Polish and Ukrainian society, I think, in, in very interesting ways. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about it. I will admit the conversation went by very fast, and I was very pleased to be able to answer your questions. Mm -hmm.